everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video I want to be talking a little bit about uh, the prey and the quarry that we hunt with our birds and some of the ethics and thinking we should have towards them in many different facets. Uh, and again, I don't talk about this topic much, and so I think it's an important one to still talk about, and I don't know why I haven't talked about it sooner. Uh, but before I jump in, if you haven't already, if you could please hit subscribe, it really does help again with this channel, and uh, keep it up and running. And uh, really just want to jump in and talk about this. We, uh, there's many people who watch these kind of videos who hate falconry and don't understand the whole thought behind it. And you know what? Before I do jump in, I want to say both in terms of falconry itself and in terms of some of these subjects I'm bringing up in these different approaches, it is okay for people to disagree. There can be more than one viewpoint. We all have to share this planet together, and I hate, it's really sad to see that the way society is trying to be is very divisive right now. And in the digital age, we can do that. I will only be friends with people who agree with everything I think, and if not, I will banish you from my life. I think it's good to hear different points of view. So, if you're a falconry hater watching this show, looking for ammo, then I hope that this video can maybe give you some good perspectives on some of the thinking about falconry and what it is. Because, again, it's okay. You don't have to be a lover of falconry, but you should understand. I always want to understand other people's perspectives and points of view, even if I'm not going to end up agreeing with them. I will be a better human being if I understand a broader picture. And also, in the falconry community, some of the thoughts I will share, if they're different, that's okay. And I just want to preface that. Now, when falconry is not just keeping a bird, it's the act of, we usually say, training a bird to hunt, which is actually, for my personal definition, not true. Falconry happens in the wild every day without the human part. Falcons are hunting birds. Hawks and eagles are chasing prey and catching every single day of their life. Now, if you live in a la-la-la-la-la world where you think that that's not the case, fine, live in your sanitized fancy city glued to your phone, oblivious to reality. But the truth is, without death, there is no life. Plants die, animals die, fungi die, insects die, microorganisms die, so that living things can continue on to derive energy from that and continue on. We sanitize that in today's world. We do everything we can to, especially in the United States, uh, even the way meat is packaged, to draw attention away from that. Your dog food, oh my dog, I give him a healthy diet. I don't think animals should die. Look at the ingredients. That little doggy biscuit, that dog food nugget is compressed out of plants and animals that were killed to make it. In nature, in the natural order, there is this grand dance, this harsh dance of death and life and death and life. The predator catches the prey, it lives another day. The predator misses the prey, it might starve to death, and the prey goes on to live. That is nature. That is nature. Now, uh, a mentor of mine who I, I don't normally mention him by name because I don't like to mention people uh, and their experiences without asking me ahead of time, but I think this is okay. Uh, a falconer mentor who I have the greatest respect for, Steve Chingren, um, and I'm going to also include a link to his YouTube channel because I highly recommend learning from his experiences and his videos. A, a truly amazing, remarkable falconer and wildlife educator of the highest caliber. Years ago, he pointed out to me and he said this statement more than once. And I share it and that's why I'm mentioning him is because I want to make sure that I'm, that this, you understand this is his statement. Uh, he says, falconry is a totally natural experience for both predator and prey. There is nothing unnatural about a hawk chasing a rabbit, a falcon chasing a grouse. That happens in the wild, even if humans don't exist. The human part is the only part that's a little strange. But other than that, a falcon hunting a pigeon that's nature. That's just nature. If humans went extinct and all the falconry haters in the world are like, it's wrong that you're training a falcon to hunt a pigeon, all were extinct, falcons would still be hunting pigeons in the wild every day. So what's really special about falconry is our chance to 
put ourselves back in. I've done videos about this before where we're disconnected from this cycle of life and death and falconry gives us a chance to briefly get back in, to have your bird flying and try to catch prey, to have your falcon maybe become prey. My hat's off, I have a friend, I, I won't mention him because of this loss, but hey, I have a friend who recently had his jeer falcon killed by a golden eagle in the wild which at that is just knifing when that happens. But again, an eagle trying to kill a falcon is a natural experience. So even though you're crushed, you're angry, you're devastated, it's like, that's nature. That is what happens in nature. Sometimes the falcon catches a grouse, sometimes the eagle catches the falcon. It, but that's what happens. So again, falconry, natural experience for both predator and prey. But here's the thing about falconry. We come into it from different angles. Some people come into it for a love of the birds. That was me. I just loved birds of prey and was so fascinated by them. That's what pulled me in. Some people, uh, it's they want to live history. Some people get into it because they want attention. And then hopefully they kind of grow out of that and learn to love the sport for what it is. Some people get into it for a unique way to hunt. There's a falconer in Utah who is an older gentleman and he had done every form of hunting he could and he's like, hey, I want to be challenged. I'm going to take up falconry. And boy, he's done great. But he came into it from a totally different angle than me. I was a bunny hugger who couldn't have imagined hunting when I got into it. I just loved the birds. That's what drew me in. So we came from opposite and came into the same thing. Now, when we're hunting with these birds, even though it's a natural experience, there's a wide range of prey, right? You might be hunting sparrows, you might be hunting Canadian geese, grouse, jackrabbits, who knows? It depends on what you have. But when you do this, we always say in falconry, a falconer is gonna have the most success if they hunt uh, a prey species that is native to their area, that is common to the area, and they choose to for their bird to hunt with a species that is native to their area that naturally hunts this species. So, for example, if you live in an area with tons of quail and you have cooper's hawks, which naturally hunt quail, if you get a cooper's hawk, you're going to have a lot of success hunting those quail. Uh, that doesn't mean that's what you have to do. Maybe you want to push kestrels to hunt starlings or maybe... I've done... Uh, you've seen my videos. I've done weird things, hunting with harriers. Uh, you know, I had a, a Harris hawk that I entirely focused on hunting canal ducks. She would even dive in the water with them. And it's like, that's not normal Harris hawk prey. Still had a great old time. But usually you will have the most success again if you follow that formula. You don't have to, but you have the most success. But here's something to always remember that Steve Shingren also always liked to mention. He said, hey, we should have a respect for the prey, for the quarry. I, almost every falconer I know of who has been in it for a long time, even if they didn't start off with the respect for the prey, they develop it. They Being connected back in that circle of life and death, life and death, loss and gain, loss and gain, out in nature, you start to see it and you start to, hey, boy, even if the prey gets away, I'm like, good job, well done, noble sparrow that evaded my Merlin. That is a very athletic, powerful sparrow, and I salute that incredible flight. And I'll take my bird home and feed it up, okay? Uh, you're, oh, hey, the jackrabbit got away from that eagle. I mean, it's amazing to watch with, with golden eagles and jackrabbits. Uh, they, they know, and jackrabbits will wait, and an eagle, a young eagle, starting to come down, if the rabbit stops and it looks and its ears are just up, it's like, okay, I'm going to go down, and that rabbit at the last second will wait and will jump over the eagle. Same thing in pursuit. They will watch, and an inexperienced eagle will have a rabbit literally jump over it. When I see that, I have respect for that prey, and I think, hey, bravo, well done, rabbit. Uh, in the wild, they do the same thing. I have seen a wild first-year golden eagle out in Rush Valley have the same thing happen. So again, totally natural experience for both predator and prey, other than I happened to be there watching and the bird was on my fist for a few seconds before that. It's kind of interesting to watch. Having a respect for the prey, I think, is very different. We as humans have a primal nature where we are came from hunter-gatherer backgrounds. If you are successful in a hunt, 
there is often a deeply seated primal side to celebrate, to be like, yes! And I'm not saying we can't do that, but this comes from, think about it, in those Ice Age times when, you know, hey, if the hunters don't come back with food, we might all starve to death and we don't know if they're going to be successful or not or get eaten by a cave bear. Wait, I hear them. Hey, they do come. Look, they've got half an elk strung between them and it's like, yes, and it's like, I am a mighty hunter. Look what I've done. Look, I have helped feed this village. It's cause to celebrate. It means we're not going to die. Yay. And so I know a lot of times people get upset about um, when online in this digital era where, oh, look at this kill. I, I hunted a deer. I'm posing with it. Or, hey, look at this. I, you know, my hawk caught five rabbits today. I'm holding up the rabbits. I'm like, yeah. It comes from a primal place that is a human place. And even though we're getting into a more and more urbanized world where where for some people in some areas that seems uh, inappropriate. But you know what? It comes from a very natural human side of like, I was successful in my efforts in a hunt. We will eat now. We will survive. So it's a primal celebratory simian, social simian thing to do. But I do want to at least mention perhaps a different way to look at. There is nothing wrong with being a successful hunter. There's nothing wrong with celebrating the victories of you and your bird teaming up together and having that. But I definitely like to foster an idea of respect. I think it is wise, not just for public perception, but, and again, I know this sounds a little preachy and I hope it doesn't. I'm just sharing thoughts that I think are of worth. I think we are better falconers if we foster that respect. And if we have a like, hey, you know what? Yes, okay, I can take a picture, I can share this, or, but, but if all our thing is, what's your kill count? How many, how many rabbits did you kill this year? Okay, if you want to tally that, fine. But if that's your whole goal, on the one hand, that's good. You're getting your bird out, you're getting them exercise, you're getting them hunted, so you're, you're being a good falconer. But on the other hand, if that's your focus, you, in, in some ways, you might be missing the mark. Not that it's wrong to keep track, but if that's your sole emphasis is, how many things did we kill? As opposed to, hey, I'm going out there, I'm reconnecting with that circle of life and death. Some of the days my bird caught game, some of the days it missed and the prey got away. And instead of swearing and cussing and being mad, the rabbit got away, it's like, wow incredible athleticism demonstrated worthy of a National Geographic documentary. I really feel that way. I really feel having that respect and showing it. And again, everybody's going to have a different opinion on what that respect looks like. But again, having a reverence and a respect for life and all life <clears throat> has a desire to live and perpetuate. All life is fighting to live. If the hunter is chasing prey, it's hunting because it has an innate desire to live. If the prey is running away from the predator, it's running off of the same base impulse, okay? So respect that, respect that desire to live, respect that life and death is part of it, but just whatever you do, whether you're racking up kill counts or not mentioning them to your friends, whether you're taking photos and sharing them online or not, I don't care, whatever, do your thing. But I just, I, I encourage, and, and if I have a, falcon, a new apprentice, I always tell us, I encourage you to, before you do those kind of things, whatever you may be doing, to do it through the lens of, am I showing respect for the prey? Am I showing, do I have a love and respect for that prey? Because I think you will be healthier. I think you'll be more whole. I think you will be a better falconer and a better hunter if you put it through that lens and say, how am I wording this, you know? Am I wording this in a way with my friends that fosters that kind of thing? And again, if that's sounding preachy, I understand, fine. And if you disagree, that's cool. I am just sharing what I have seen. And the falconers I respect most uh, are ones that, even though they're excited about going hunting and they want to have success with their bird, they have a love and respect for the prey. Now, I want to talk about this when it comes to actual hunting, because what will happen is, some areas like uh, I live in the United States, we have very strict laws on and seasons. 
we have hunting seasons, we have bag and possession limits. How many of a species? Here's the season. Okay, you can get this X number of ducks during that season, or they can only be these species, or they can only be these genders. So there are these laws in place. Some countries do not have such laws, and that is partly why I want to share this, because there, you need to know and understand the prey in order for your predatory bird to be a successful hunter. You have to know, what time of year will I find prey in this area? Uh, what time of year does this prey breed and reproduce? And that matters um, usually in the United States. Usually our hunting laws, seasons, bag and possession limits are typically based off of biology. They're based off of, okay, well, this time of year the deer have not bred yet so we're going to wait and hunting season maybe we'll start after the female deer the does are pregnant and we'll say you can't hunt the does but you can hunt a buck now so we've kind of sired the next generation and we'll help keep populations up accordingly things like that right so for example take jackrabbits Jackrabbits, cottontail rabbits in my area are very cyclical there's a time of year fall and winter they're not having babies. They shouldn't be, right? So spring and summer, you're going to have the babies. So I don't hunt in the spring and summer. I hunt in the fall and winter. Now, with cottontail rabbits, that's decided for me because by law, it's a protected species. You have to have a hunting permit. And so you can only hunt when the government says. But a jackrabbit, you can legally hunt year round. In my area, rabbits are at a very low population right now. Uh, we've had a few diseases like hemorrhaging disease sweep through the wild population and we're in a drought. So I don't see very many of them. So I personally choose not to hunt them unless it's the fall and winter. Now stay with me for a second. I have a lot of falconers and friends that do hunt jackrabbits year round with their birds. Um, I'm molting my birds in the summer, so I don't do that. But I am not trying to rip on the people who choose to because here's the logic behind it. There's sound logic. Remember, every single day in the wild, a bird is having to hunt and make a kill. Every single day it has to, regardless of ethics, regardless of if, oh, this is the time of year that the rabbits are breeding. They're like, I don't care, I still have to eat. Golden Eagle's still gonna hunt rabbits. A falconer, I don't think any falconer will ever take the same number of prey that a wild bird does. Even if you're hunting your bird every day, all day, you're still, a wild bird is still going to be more fit and is still going to take more prey. So even you doing your very best getting your bird out hunting is not going to impact a wild population of prey the same way, the same small way that a wild bird would. So it doesn't matter. So hunt year round, right? That's sound logic as well. Um, so, but for me personally, what, like locally, locally I see that rabbits are low, so I choose to do it at a time of year when, uh, when, when breeding is not happening and babies are not being born. Now we can see, uh, and again, I'm not saying that that is how it should be. I'm just trying to give an example of how some of the ethics and laws and times of year to hunt should be looked at maybe through a biological lens and what's going on in your area. If there's plenty of a species, maybe it doesn't matter that much to you as long as you're following whatever your laws are. What's actually interesting about this is some of the same principle can be witnessed in the wild. Prey, well, all species have the instinct of got to pass on my DNA. Go read Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene. And it's just like, you just, wow, it opens your mind. It's like replicate, pass on your DNA at all costs, right? Just why genetically we are so stuck on looking after our, our future posterity and, and why, okay, I will go hungry to feed my children. Well, what if there's not enough food to feed those children? That's something that happens in the wild. And with birds of prey, we witness some very interesting things, especially where I live in a high desert. So I have mountains, I have desert, I have snow, but I have droughts as well. And what I see is species choosing whether or not to start a family on a year based off of prey populations because things are limited. So for example, uh, here locally, we have Northern goshawks. We have a lot of Northern goshawks in our mountains. If these goshawks, our goshawks, Northern Utah and also Northern Nevada, a lot of our goshawks are very much honed in on their breeding cycle being connected to you into ground squirrels. 
And if and with with rabbits and with rodents, those populations go up and down. You'll have boom years for several years, and then they crash. And the species are still there, but they're very limited. And what happens is, for example, in my area, there's a nest that every year they're waiting, they're waiting, they they pair up and they, they, they attend to their nest, there's still snow on the ground, and they're watching and they're waiting, and there's this one section of this one nest I always watch where there's this southern facing slope, and it's the first to have the snow melt. And the winter ground squirrels, we locally call them pot guts here, uh, they come out and they come out of hibernation and they're eating the grass and in their little burrows, and that slope is the first because it's the first to melt, it's also the first to have new grasses and new fresh greens appear, and they're eating. If those goshawks up the hill, they wait and they come and they watch, watch, watch. I've filmed them doing it. I've watched it for years. If they see, oh, it's a bumper crop year. There's tons of these. You went to ground squirrels. Let's start a family. Then they do. And if there's hardly any, they understand, oh, whatever, the population's crashing. Maybe the disease is spread through these colonies. Uh, we shouldn't. And they will not nest. They still defend that nesting territory, but they realize there's not enough prey for us to start a family, so we're not going to do it. Same thing with golden eagles. Uh, golden eagles are very adaptable. Uh, our local golden eagles love to eat jackrabbits and cottontail rabbits. They hunt a lot of other prey, a surprising amount of avian prey, any rodent you can think of from kangaroo rats to, to, to voles and anything in between, pack rats. They'll hunt whatever they have to. They'll even hunt large prey like deer and antelope, but they want to hunt rabbits. Rabbits are a good, consistent thing. And what I've seen is a nest like uh, White Rocks, Utah is a nest that is very tied into whatever the populations are. And at this nest site, at this this cliff face, if there are rabbits, boy, they will nest every single year. If the rabbit population crashes at this nest site, then they'll take a year to try to get whatever else they can, smaller rodents, birds, snakes, and and I, you know, I can you know film it. You can get up on the surrounding bluff and zoom in with your telephoto and see. And if that nest, <clears throat> after a year of just getting non-rabbit food, isn't really working for them, then the next year they are there, but they will not attend to their nest for years until the rabbit population reappears. There's just no reason to because it takes so much protein and calcium to build a baby eagle into an adult that if you don't have the food available to do it and you're just barely finding enough to survive yourself, why make the investment? So even though hunting year round does happen with wild raptors, it is interesting to note, not for any ethical reason, but a logistical survival reason, that many species will choose it seemingly not to. They'll still pair up, but they just will not uh, start a family, won't lay eggs, and, and won't mate with each other. They will do those things if the food base is not there available to do it. Because, it, you know, then there's not enough for anybody, including yourself. And if you're dead, how are you going to feed your offspring? So it's, it's always good in your area learn about your prey have respect for the uh, this, the prey species that you intend to hunt learn wh where do they live what's the population like what are the laws in the area to hunt the species what are the seasons uh is it a species that the populations go up and down or are they just always consistent learn these things and and kind of view through a lens of respect and biology and an ethical attitude what you hunt, when you hunt, and where you hunt. It's a way better way to approach falconry. I really do think that if it's just like, hey, I'm going to go out there and what could I kill with my bird? Even though that's a person who's still going to have success, I just feel like it's not the healthiest attitude to approach the sport of falconry. I think it is healthier to say, hey, what, what can I do to keep things in balance? I am entering back in to the circle of life and death that happens in nature every day. Uh, we have done everything to pull ourselves out. I want to go back into that circle and learn from it, experience it, and fully understand and enjoy it. And again, the, if you have respect and knowledge and love for the prey species, you will have a much richer, more abundant, and more worthwhile experience in the sport of falconry. So every region is different, but learn your region. 
I hope this topic was of interest to you. Uh, let me know your thoughts down below. And I know a lot of people from all over the world watch this channel. Let us know in your area. Do you have laws? Do you have seasons? Do you have bag limits? Who makes that? Is it the government who does that? Is it private land ownership? What is the driving force? I, I'm a firm believer that biology is a is the wisest way to make those seasons, if you have seasons, you're at. What is the biology? What is sustainable? What populations are too high and could could have more culling? Which populations are down and should have more restrictions? Uh, I think biology is a great way to make those policies. No matter what our emotions say, uh, emotions are not biology, and emotions are not going to save or harm species. It's uh, it's a good solid. Uh, on the ground field work in biology that I think is best for those decisions. But uh, again, I hope you enjoyed this video. I uh, hope you hit subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, happy hockey.